Hello everybody. Welcome to Daily News Simplified and answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading. Today we shall be analyzing the Hindu newspaper dated 4th of October 2019 of the New Delhi edition. The topics to be discussed today has been presented on your screen. Time stamping for the same has been provided in the description box below. Let us begin our today's discussion. The first article appears on page number 11. The title of the article is Cooperative Banks is Dual Regulation the Problem. This article shall be important mainly from the perspective of GS Paper 3 Economy under the subsection Indian Economy and Various Issues. Now before analyzing this particular article, let us first look into its background. Recently an urban cooperative bank known as the Punjab and Maharashtra Cooperative Bank was involved in alleged irregularities in reporting the NPS. Because of this, RBI has imposed a set of restrictions on the Punjab and Maharashtra Cooperative Bank. Now these restrictions include, first and foremost, the RBI has stated that the depositors of this particular bank will not be able to withdraw more than rupees 10,000 for the next 6 months. On similar lines, the RBI has also stated that the bank will not be allowed to accept the fresh deposits as well as extend loans. And lastly, the RBI has put the PMC bank under its directions, which means to say that the RBI has superseded the board of directors of this particular bank and it has taken over the direct management and control of the Punjab and Maharashtra Cooperative Bank. Now these restrictions imposed by the RBI raises grave concern for the Indian banking sector. This is because first and foremost already the banks in India have accumulated higher amount of non-performing assets. Hence the very fact that the urban cooperative banks are under reporting the non-performing assets raises grave concern over the poor balance sheets of the banks in India. Secondly, the RBI's decision to impose a withdrawal limit of rupees 10,000 on the depositors' money has also caused a widespread panic among the depositors of the bank. And this comes at the time when the public confidence in the banking system was getting restored after the demonetization and people were actually coming forward to deposit their money with the banks. Hence, the latest crisis in the PMC bank would dent the public confidence in the banking system. And lastly, the latest crisis in the PMC bank also raises grave concerns related to the governance and regulation of the urban cooperative banks in India. In this regard, this particular article here is in a form of an interview with two renowned economists in India, wherein it discusses about the various problems of the urban cooperative banks and also highlights as to what measures should have to be undertaken in order to improve the governance and regulation of the urban cooperative banks. Hence, as part of this video analysis, let us understand as to what exactly are the cooperative banks, how these cooperative banks are different from the scheduled commercial banks and what can be done in order to prevent the repeat of the PMC crisis. Now, if you look at the banking structure in India, Banks as such can be categorized into two types that is the scheduled banks and the non-scheduled banks. Now scheduled banks are basically those banks which have been listed under the second schedule of the RBI Act 1934 and these banks as such should have a paid up capital of rupees 5 lakhs and they should give an undertaking to the RBI that they would operate in the best interest of the depositors. However, it is to be noted that Apart from these criteria, which has been stipulated under the RBI Act 1934, the Reserve Bank of India may also lay down certain additional criteria for issuing licenses to the banks to operate as the scheduled banks. And those banks which do not meet these criteria are referred to as the non-scheduled banks. Now with respect to scheduled banks, the scheduled banks in turn are categorized into two types that is the scheduled commercial banks and the scheduled cooperative banks. The scheduled commercial banks include the State Bank of India, the various nationalized banks in India, the private sector banks which include both domestic as well as the foreign private sector banks as well as the regional rural banks which are also referred to as the Grameen banks. So all these banks are together referred to as the scheduled commercial banks. And the second category is the scheduled cooperative banks. And the scheduled cooperative banks are basically some of the urban cooperative banks which meet the criteria as stipulated by the RBI. And please note that not all the urban cooperative banks are presently categorized as the scheduled cooperative banks. 
some of the urban cooperative banks do not meet the criteria as stipulated by the RBI and are accordingly categorized under the non-scheduled banks in India. So what exactly are the cooperative banks? As you can look at the definition here, the cooperative bank is basically a financial entity which belongs to its members who are at the same time the owners as well as the customers of a bank. A group of people who belong to the same profession or a locality may come together, pool in their money so as to set up the cooperative bank. Now these group of people will be both members as well as the owners of the cooperative banks. And if any member of the cooperative bank is in need of money, such a member can simply borrow money from the cooperative bank and thus such a member becomes a customer of the bank. Now for example, a group of farmers in a particular region of a country may come together, pool in their money and set up the cooperative bank. And in case if any of the farmer needs money, he can borrow the money from the cooperative bank and thus such a farmer becomes both the owner as well as the customer of the bank. So how are these cooperative banks different from the scheduled commercial banks? It is to be noted that the scheduled commercial banks are registered under the Companies Act whereas the scheduled cooperative banks are registered under the Cooperative Societies Registration Act. Similarly, all the scheduled commercial banks are regulated by the RBI whereas the scheduled cooperative banks face the dual regulation of both RBI as well as the registrar of the cooperative societies wherein the Reserve Bank of India regulates all the banking related operations of the cooperative banks under the Banking Regulation Act 1949 whereas the registrar of the cooperative societies looks into the governance and management of the cooperative societies under the Cooperative Societies Registration Act. The next difference is being the scheduled cooperative banks operate in a pyramidical fashion with state level cooperative bank at the highest level followed by the district cooperative bank and the village cooperative bank. On the other hand, the scheduled commercial banks operate at a single level and they do not have a distinct three-tiered institutional structure like the cooperative banks. With respect to voting rights in the scheduled commercial banks, the voting rights in turn depends upon the shareholding of an entity, which means to say the overall voting rights of an entity in turn depends upon the percentage of shares owned by an entity. However, in case of a cooperative bank, the cooperative banks are considered to be more democratic in nature as compared to the commercial banks, wherein in case of cooperative bank, they follow the principle of one member one vote. Every member of the cooperative bank will exercise only one vote irrespective of his or her shareholding. And the last difference being the scheduled commercial banks basically operate on the profit motive whereas the scheduled cooperative banks operate on the principle of the cooperation. Let us now understand about the PMC bank crisis in detail. According to the annual report of the PMC bank for the year 2018-19, the PMC bank had a total deposits worth around Rs 11,000 crores and it also registered a net profit of around Rs 100 crores. However, not everything was good with respect to the balance sheets of the banks as reported in its annual report. For instance, the Reserve Bank of India found the financial irregularities in extending loans to a company known as the Housing Development and Infrastructure Limited. According to the regulations laid down by the Reserve Bank of India, the exposure of any particular bank to a single entity should not exceed more than 15% of its loan portfolio, which means to say a particular bank in India should not extend more than 15% of its loans to a single entity. Now, such a regulation has been laid down by the RBI so as to avoid the overexposure of a bank to a single entity wherein the default by a single entity can lead to the collapse of the entire bank. However, in case of the PMC bank, it was found out that the PMC bank had extended almost around Rs 6,500 crores to the HDIL company and this was around 70% of the loan portfolio of the PMC bank. So the overall loans extended by the PMC bank to the HDIL company was more than four times as stipulated by the Reserve Bank of India's guidelines. The second problem with respect to PMC Bank was with respect to under-reporting of the non-performing assets. 
According to the annual report of the PMC Bank, it reported NPS of around 2% for the year 2018-19. Now, whatever loans the PMC Bank had extended to the HDIL company had actually turned into the NPS. However, the bank failed to report these NPS because of the fear of the penal action by the RBI. So, if you account for the NPS due to the default by the HDIL company, the actual NPS of the PMC bank would be around 70% and this would be considered as the highest NPS in the banking history of India. And lastly, in spite of the fact that whatever loans the PMC bank extended to the HDIL company turned into the NPS, the bank as such went on extending loans even to this particular bankrupt company after the default. And this was in clear violation of the RBI's guidelines. So in response to the PMC bank crisis, as discussed before, the RBI has imposed a set of restrictions on the operation of this bank for a period of six months. But the question which arises here is, what should be done in order to avoid the repeat of the PMC bank crisis? In this regard, we need to implement the recommendations of the high-level panel on the urban cooperative banks which are set up by the Reserve Bank of India. Now, this particular high-level panel had suggested for converting the urban cooperative banks into the commercial bank, wherein we should fix a threshold on the business size of the urban cooperative banks of almost around Rs 20,000 crores. Now, when the business size of the urban cooperative banks increases to beyond Rs 20,000 crores, such a bank should be converted into the commercial banks and this will ensure that these banks should be regulated only by the RBI and not by the registrar of the cooperative societies. So the overall idea behind the high level panel's recommendations is to avoid the dual regulation of the urban cooperative banks and ensure that the urban cooperative banks have to be regulated by the RBI so as to improve their governance as well as their performance. Secondly, it had highlighted that once we convert all the large size urban cooperative banks with a business size of Rs 20,000 crores into commercial banks, we need to convert the smaller urban cooperative banks into the small finance banks. Now, such a recommendation has been given because the rules, regulations and norms which are followed by the small finance banks are considered to be much stringent as compared to the urban cooperative banks. And the implementation of such a recommendation would in turn strengthen the overall regulation of the urban cooperative banks. And lastly, presently all the urban cooperative banks are managed by the board of directors. And in order to strengthen the governance and the regulation of the urban cooperative banks, the high level panel had suggested that all the urban cooperative banks have to compulsorily set up the board of management which will be responsible for the overall management and control of the urban cooperative banks. And more importantly, setting up of the board of management should be mandatory for obtaining new licenses for the urban cooperative banks. Now, based upon our video analysis, a main question for your practice here could be, the failure of the urban cooperative banks raises grave concerns for the Indian banking sector. In this regard, discuss the current crisis in the PMC bank and also highlight as to how such crisis can be averted in future. Now the next article appears as a lead article on page number 10. The title of the article is The Brick and Motor of FDI 2.0. This article shall be important mainly from the perspective of GS Paper 3, Economy, under the subsection, Mobilization of Resources as well as the Investment Models. Now before analyzing this particular article, let us first look into its background. I hope you all must be aware that the foreign investment into India is categorized into foreign direct investment and foreign portfolio investment, wherein FDI is a form of foreign investment, wherein the foreign companies set up their business operations in India, wherein in case of foreign portfolio investment, a foreign company is merely buying the shares, bonds, debentures and other financial instruments issued in India. So the basic difference between FDI and FPI is that while FDI is accompanied by both ownership and management while FPI is accompanied only by the ownership and that is when the foreign company buys the shares issued by an Indian company. And based upon the recommendations of the Arvind Mayaram committee, the government of India has now stipulated that 
a foreign investment of greater than 10 percentage in an Indian company would be treated as an FDI whereas a foreign investment of equal to or less than 10 percentage shall be treated as the foreign portfolio investment. Now if you look at India's FDI policy particularly towards the technological giant companies such as Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon or Microsoft the combined revenues of these technological giant companies is around 800 billion dollars and this is considered to be much higher than the entire GDP of Saudi Arabia. Now these technological giant companies are basically able to earn profits by harnessing the data generated by the users within a particular country. However, in spite of the fact that these companies are able to earn huge amount of revenues in India, the amount of tax they pay to the Indian government is quite less. On similar lines, the increase in the profits of these technological giant companies do not translate into higher amount of benefits to the Indian users. On the other hand, if you look at the FDI policy in China, particularly towards these technological giant companies, in case of China, China has been forcing the foreign companies to transfer their technology, patents and enter into 50-50 partnership with the Chinese companies. And this is basically done in order to promote the technological development in China and to protect the domestic companies. And by following such a FDI policy, China has been able to promote the domestic internet based companies such as Alibaba or for that matter Tencent. Now both these companies are growing at a rapid pace and they are said to emerge among the technological giants of the world. However, in case of India, even though we have been able to attract huge amount of foreign direct investment, the FDI into India has adversely affected the domestic companies. Some of the homegrown companies such as Flipkart have been taken over by the global MNC such as the Walmart. On similar lines, the higher amount of FDI has not translated into higher amount of tax to the Indian government and nor has it translated into higher amount of profits for the Indian users. In this regard, this particular lead article here highlights as to what should be the India's FDI policy particularly towards the technological giant companies and it calls such a policy as FDI 2.0. Hence as part of this video analysis, let us understand as to what this particular article is suggesting with respect to the FDI policy of India. Let us first understand as to how the FDI policy in India has evolved over a period of time. Now during 1970s, India faced a huge amount of current account deficit leading to the balance of payment crisis. This balance of payment crisis basically arose because of the Gulf crisis. As part of the balance of payment crisis, India did not have sufficient amount of forex reserves to pay for its imports. In response, in the year 1978, as part of the Foreign Exchange Regulation Act, the government of India came up with a restrictive FDI policy. As part of this restrictive FDI policy, the government of India mandated that all the foreign owned companies in India have to reduce their shareholding to around 40 percentage. That means only 40 percentage of the ownership and control of these companies should be the hands of the foreign companies. And in order to reduce their shareholding to 40 percentage, the government of India stipulated that these foreign owned companies have to get listed on Indian stock exchanges such as the Bombay Stock Exchange and sell the remaining 60 percentage of the shares to the Indian entities. Now the Indian entities here could be the Indian financial institutions or the Indian retail investors. Now such a restrictive FDI policy unveiled by the government of India led to the dilution of stakes by some of the foreign companies operating in India such as the Colgate, IBM, Unilever, Sterling etc. However, post the LPG reforms in the year 1991, the government of India liberalized the FDI policy as part of the Foreign Exchange Management Act. As part of this liberalized FDI policy, the foreign companies were allowed to invest up to 100% in certain sectors of the Indian economy. For example, presently 100% FDI is allowed in some of the sectors such as the information and communication technology, coal mining, single brand retail, etc. And presently there is no requirement of dilution of ownership by these foreign companies as provided earlier under the restrictive FDI policy. 
Now, one of the main problem which has arisen because of this liberalized FDI policy is that presently the foreign owned companies are competing with the Indian companies and this is in turn leading to the erosion of profits of the domestic companies. For example, some of the foreign owned companies such as Google and Microsoft are in turn competing with Indian IT companies such as Infosys, Wipro etc. Because of which the overall profits earned by the Indian IT companies such as Infosys and Wipro is considered to be much lower because of the competition faced by these companies. And more importantly, whatever money the Indian shareholders have invested in the Indian companies, there has been an erosion in the profits of these Indian shareholders. So based upon such an argument, this particular article here argues for FDI 2.0 policy. So the basic principle behind the FDI 2.0 policy is that if you look at the internet based companies such as Google, Microsoft, Facebook etc. These internet based companies are able to make huge amount of profits through the Indian users. For example, both Google as well as Facebook earn huge amount of money through the digital advertisements in India. And since these internet based companies make huge amount of profits through the Indian users, we need to provide for a mechanism in order to ensure the distribution of such profits to the Indians as well. So the overall idea behind the FDI 2.0 policy is that since Indians contribute to a large amount of profits to these internet based companies, they should also get a certain amount of profits of these companies as well. And in order to ensure the distribution of profits to the Indians, the article here has highlighted mainly two strategies. The first strategy is related to the listing of the foreign owned MNCs in India. Now some of the countries such as Mexico, Bangladesh, Vietnam etc have encouraged the foreign MNCs to get listed on the stock exchanges by providing them with the tax incentives. Wherein these countries have stated that if a foreign MNC is listed on the stock exchanges then the foreign MNC would attract a tax rate that would be same as the tax rate applicable to the domestic companies. On the other hand, if a foreign MNC does not get listed on the stock exchanges, then such a foreign MNC would be liable to pay a higher amount of tax rate. So we need to replicate the FDI policy of these countries and encourage the foreign MNCs to get listed on Indian stock exchanges such as the Bombay Stock Exchange, the National Stock Exchange etc. by providing them with the tax incentives. Wherein just like other countries what we can do here is that we can state that the listed MNCs they would be taxed on par with the domestic companies whereas the non listed MNCs would be liable to pay a higher amount of tax. So by encouraging the foreign MNCs to list on the Indian stock exchanges we would enable the Indians to buy the shares of these companies and thus we would be able to ensure that whatever profits these internet based companies are earning such profits would be distributed among the Indians as well. The second strategy is related to allowing the trading of the global MNC shares on the Indian stock exchanges. Now if you look at the way these internet based companies account for their profits, these companies as such account for a higher amount of profits in their host country and they account for a less amount of profits in India. And such a mechanism has been adopted by these companies for the tax avoidance. So apart from enabling the Indians to have a share of profits earned by these companies in India, we must also ensure that the Indians are able to get a share of profits which these companies earn from the global level. In this regard, this article has highlighted that we should allow the dollar denominated shares of these MNCs to be allowed to trade on Indian stock exchanges and such a facility will enable the Indian shareholders to have a share of their global profits as well. So the first strategy of listing in India would enable the Indians to have a share of profits which these internet based companies make in India and the second strategy of trading in India would enable the Indians to have a share of their global profits as well. So these are some of the important aspects which one should know with respect to this particular article. Now based upon our discussion a main question for your practice here could be the FDA policy in India has to be reoriented in order to address the challenges rising from the internet based MNCs. In this regard discuss as to how India can use the strategic tool of list or trade in India to enable the Indians to become the shareholders in the MNCs.
The next article appears on page number 10. The title of the article is Making the Political Parties Accountable. This article shall be important mainly from the perspective of GS Paper 2, Governance, under the subsection Important Aspects of Governance, Transparency and Accountability. Recently, in a landmark case known as the DAV College Trust versus the Director of Public Instructions, the Supreme Court of India has ruled that the NGOs would come under the ambit of the Right to Information Act. And the reason given by the Supreme Court was that these NGOs as such receive substantial amount of funding from the government and because of which these NGOs, they can be considered as the public authorities as defined under Section 2 of the RTI Act. Now, because of this particular judgment of the Supreme Court, this article here argues that even the political parties in India should be brought within the ambit of the RTI Act. This is because just like the NGOs, even the political parties receive substantial amount of funding from the government. Now the need to bring the political parties under the ambit of the RTI Act has been comprehensively been discussed in our DNS dated 22nd of March 2019. So what I would do here is that I would attach the previous video for your revision. Now before analyzing this particular article, let us first look into its background. Now you all must be aware that the political parties in India get huge amount of funding from the corporate entities. Now such a mechanism has been provided in order to enable the political parties to fund their election related expenditures. However, one main problem which arises with respect to the corporate funding of the political parties is that through this particular funding, the corporate entities would be able to influence the policies of the political parties, which means to say the political parties may frame policies which would benefit the corporate entities. Hence, it is being said that the corporate funding of the political parties would lead to a nexus of political parties and the corporate entities leading to an increase in corruption. And more importantly, such a funding actually strikes at the roots of the democracy in India. Hence, in order to avoid these problems, there is a need for transparency in the funding of political parties, wherein people should be aware as to which political parties in India are getting the money from the corporates and which corporate entity is funding the political parties in India. Now, such a mechanism would ensure that there is a transparency in the funding of elections in India and this can to a certain extent prevent the nexus as well as the corruption which is presently taking place in India. Hence, in order to improve the transparency of the political parties in India, in the year 2010, an NGO by the name Association for Democratic Reforms filed for an RTI request. Now, in this particular RTI request, the Association for Democratic Reforms sought certain information from the political parties related to the donations which it had received from the corporate entities. Now, the RTI Act provides that all the public authorities in India should compulsorily disclose information when an RTI application is sought. However, the RTI Act does not explicitly mention that the political parties are public authorities. However, in the year 2013, the Chief Information Commissioner ruled that the political parties would be deemed as public authorities under the RTI Act. So, since the political parties would be considered as public authorities under the RTI Act, the political parties would be under obligation to disclose information related to political funding. Now, this particular ruling by the Chief Information Commissioner sought to improve the functioning of political parties in India and more importantly, bring about transparency in the funding of elections. However, as the title of this particular article suggests, the political parties have so far failed to comply with the RTI Act, wherein the political parties have been arguing that they cannot be deemed as the public authorities under the RTI Act. And because of this, they cannot be compelled to disclose information related to the political funding. Now, because of this failure of the political parties to comply with the RTI Act, some of the RTI activists have filed a PIL before the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court is set to hear these PILs next week. Hence, as part of this video analysis, we'll first understand as to what are the arguments for bringing the political parties under the RTI Act and secondly, the arguments put forward by the political parties as to why they should not be brought under the RTI Act. Further, an expected UPSC mains question from this particular article could be 
there's a need for bringing the political parties under the ambit of RTI Act in order to improve the transparency in the funding of elections. Discuss. Let us now start analyzing these aspects of the article one by one. Let us first understand the arguments for bringing the political parties under the RTI Act. Now, as we have discussed before, the political parties have been arguing that they cannot be deemed as public authorities under the RTI Act. So, what exactly is the definition of public authority under the RTI Act? Now, the RTI Act defines public authority as a constitutional body, a statutory body which may be set up by the parliament or the concerned state legislature or a body which is substantially funded by the government. So if one looks at the definition of public authority given under the RTA Act, it can be seen that the political parties are not constitutional body, they are not statutory body and they are not substantially funded by the government of India. It is because of these reasons the political parties have been arguing that they cannot be deemed as public authorities under the RTI Act. However, you need to note here that the political parties form the base of our democracy which means to say they are the invisible force of a democratic country and the political parties are considered to be quite vital for the functioning of a democracy. Now for example, even though the political parties are not constitutional body nor the statutory bodies, the constitution of India has recognized the important role of the political parties in India wherein the political parties are allowed to choose the candidates for contesting elections in India. Further, whenever voting is taking place either in the parliament or the state legislatures, the political parties are empowered to issue the party whips and if a member of the parliament or a member of state legislative assembly fails to vote according to the guidelines issued by the political party, he or she can be disqualified under the anti-defection. Further, the role of political parties is also recognized through various parliamentary conventions such as the Speaker of Lok Sabha is normally appointed from the ruling party whereas the Deputy Speaker of the Lok Sabha is normally appointed from the opposition party. Similarly, with respect to appointment of the members of the parliamentary committees, the parliamentary conventions have provided for representation to the political parties. For example, the chairperson of the Public Accounts Committee is invariably from the opposition party. Now, which means to say, even though political parties are neither constitutional body not the statutory body, they are considered to be quite vital for the functioning of democracy. Similarly, it can also be argued that even the political parties are not constitutional bodies, the Indian constitution has recognized the role of political parties in India as evident in the Schedule 10 of the Indian constitution. Apart from these reasons, the Chief Information Commissioner has also ruled that the political parties are deemed as public authorities under the RTI Act. This is because the political parties in India enjoy multiple benefits. For example, the political parties are allocated the office spaces by the government at concessional rates. Apart from that, the political parties are also allowed certain free time on Doordarshan as well as All India Radio. So since the political parties receive benefits from the government, they can be deemed as the public authorities in India. Thirdly, it can be argued that bringing the political parties under the Right to Information Act would lead to improvement in transparency in the funding of elections. This is because according to Association of Democratic Reforms, almost 35% of funding of political parties is mainly received from the black money. And this is in turn leading to the nexus between the political parties and corporates leading to increase in corruption. Apart from that, even though Foreign Contribution Regulation Act prohibits the political parties to receive the foreign contribution, it has been observed that some of the political parties in India have been illegally been receiving the foreign contributions. And lastly, it can be stated that by bringing the political parties under the Right to Information Act, we would be able to bridge the trust deficit and improve the confidence in the functioning of political parties in India. Now, in spite of these arguments for bringing the political parties under the RTI Act, the political parties have been arguing that they cannot be deemed as public authorities under the RTI Act. Hence, they cannot be compelled to disclose the information. Let us understand the stand of political parties with respect to the RTI Act. Now, the political parties have been arguing that they are neither established under the Indian constitution nor established through an act passed by the Indian parliament. 
So if one looks at the definition of public authority under the RTA Act, the political parties cannot be deemed as public authorities under the RTA Act. Similarly, some of the political parties argue that the RTA information can be misused by their political opponents to disclose information related to the internal functioning of the political parties. For example, a political party may decide to issue a ticket to a particular person in a constituency by taking into account the caste-based equations of that particular constituency. Now, such a decision of the political party can be considered to be a sensitive information and should not be revealed under the RTA Act. And if such a information is released, it can be misused by their political opponents. Apart from these two reasons, the political parties have also argued that they are presently disclosing all the financial related information to the income tax department under the IT Act. Hence, because they are already disclosing the information, there is no need for them to come under the RTI Act. So if one looks at the arguments and counter arguments for bringing the political parties under the RTI Act, we can conclude that by bringing the political parties within the ambit of RTI Act, we would be able to bring about transparency in the funding of elections. And this would go a long way in the strengthening of Indian democracy. So these are some of the important aspects which one must know with respect to this particular article. Further, based upon our video analysis, you can try writing answer to this expected UPSC mains question. Now the next article appears on page number 8. The title of the article is Drone Cameras Threatening the Nilgiri's Wildlife. This article shall be important mainly from the perspective of prelims under the subsection General Issues on Environmental Ecology. Now this particular article here highlights that the amateur wildlife photography which is carried out through the usage of the drone cameras has adversely affected the biodiversity in the Nilgiri's Biosphere Reserve. This is because the various prey birds such as falcons, vultures etc. have attacked the drone cameras by mistaking them as preys and have got hurt accordingly. So the usage of the drone cameras in the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve has raised concerns related to the loss of biodiversity. In this regard, it is to be noted that presently the usage of the drone cameras has been prohibited in the eco-sensitive zones of the forest. However, the drone cameras as such can be used only with the permission of the chief wildlife warden. However, the problem which arises here is that this prohibition on the usage of the drone cameras has not been implemented properly. So accordingly, the forest department as such has to improve its policing to avoid the usage of the drone cameras in the eco-sensitive zones. Apart from that, we also need to enhance the awareness levels particularly among the locals and tourists and if needed, higher fines can be imposed for the usage of the drone cameras in the eco-sensitive zones. Now coming to Nilgiri's Biosphere Reserve, this particular image is a map of the Nilgiri's Biosphere Reserve. As you can see here, the Nilgiri's Biosphere Reserve is located at the tri-junction of Karnataka, Kerala and Tamil Nadu. And this was the first Biosphere Reserve to be established in India way back in the year 1986. And some of the protected areas in the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve include the Bandipur National Park, the Madhumulai Wildlife Sanctuary in Tamil Nadu, Vainad Wildlife Sanctuary in Kerala, Nagarhole National Park in Karnataka, Mukurthi National Park in Tamil Nadu and Silent Valley National Park in Kerala. The list of these protected areas included under the Nilgiri's Biosphere Reserves becomes quite important with respect to your prelims. The next article appears on page number 20. The title of the article is Killer Fungus Found in Australia. This article shall be important mainly from the perspective of prelims under the subsection General Issues on Environmental Ecology. Now this particular article here highlights that one of the world's deadliest fungus known as the poison fire coral fungus has been identified growing in Australia for the first time. If you look at the native habitat of this particular coral fungus, it is mainly found in the mountains of Japan and Korea. Previously, a large number of people in Japan and Korea had mistaken this particular coral fungus as a edible mushroom and it subsequently led to a death of large number of people. With respect to health impact of consuming this particular coral fungus, it leads to both organ failure as well as the brain damage. And among all the toxic fungus, this particular fungus is considered to be more dangerous because the toxins of this particular fungus can also be observed through the skin. 
Further, the touching of this fungus can also cause the skin inflammations. Now, as to why this particular article becomes important with respect to your prelims is because in previous year prelims, questions have been asked with respect to important plants as well as the invasive species. That is why this particular article becomes important with respect to your prelims examination. Based upon our discussion, these four questions shall be a prelims question for the practice. Please pause this video and try to find answers to these four questions. We shall be discussing the answer after 5 seconds. The first question here is, consider the following statements related to the scheduled banks in India. The first statement here is, they are listed under the second schedule of the RBI Act 1934. This statement here is correct. The second statement reads as, they need to have a minimum paid up capital of Rs 100 crores. This statement here is wrong. This is because they need to have a minimum paid up capital of Rs 5 lakhs. The third statement reads as all the cooperative banks and the regional rural banks are categorized under the scheduled banks. Now even this particular statement here is wrong. This is because only some of the cooperative banks are categorized under the scheduled banks. So if you look at the options which are given here, the correct answer to this particular question shall be A, that is one only. Now coming to second question, the question here is consider the following statements related to the differences between FDI and FPI. The first statement here is the FDI is accompanied by both ownership and management while FPI is accompanied only by ownership. As we have discussed, this statement here is correct. The second statement reads as FDI is mainly long term while FPI is mainly short term in nature. Now this particular statement here is correct. This is because since FPI mainly make investment in shares, bonds, etc. It is considered to be mainly short term in nature, unlike the FDI, which is long term. The third statement reads as the FPI is considered to be more volatile than FDI and hence it is called as the hot money. Even this particular statement here is correct. So if you look at the options which are given here, the correct answer to this particular question shall be D. That is 1, 2 and 3. Now coming to third question, the question here is, Consider the following statements related to the cooperative banks in India. The first statement reads as they are registered under the Cooperative Societies Registration Act. This statement is correct as we have discussed. The second statement reads as the provisions of Banking Regulation Act 1949 are not applicable to the cooperative banks. This statement here is wrong. This is because some of the provisions of the Banking Regulation Act 1949 are applicable to the cooperative banks. So if you look at the options which are given here, the correct answer to this particular question shall be A, that is one only. Now coming to last question, the question here is, which among the following can be considered as the public authority under the RTI Act? And the options which are given here are constitutional body, statutory body, and a body which is substantially funded by the government of India. And as we have discussed, all of these three bodies are considered as public authorities under the RTI Act. Hence, the correct answer to this particular question shall be D. With this, we have come to end of today's discussion. Now, let us have a look at the question for the day.